Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to tonight's second half. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman, Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It does not cost a cent. Click that like button. Takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon. And folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump into tonight's second half, shall we? Today's first terrifying experience. I figure that sharing this experience may make someone else vigilant with their own loved ones while in the woods. I'm going to be extremely detailed as I know there are many people who are very well versed in investigations and in research pertaining to this subject, and details do matter. The location of this experience is in Washington State, in Mount Baker, Snoqualmie National Forest just outside of Greenwater, Washington. To narrow this down a little bit more, we are talking about an area that oversees Stampede Pass, very middle of nowhere. To give a little bit of background on my wife and I, we are decently skilled in the woods and desert. We are one of those weird couples that use our PTO driving around the country, overland camping in terrible conditions, before a three-day party in Vegas and drive home. We've been lost in the woods, broken down in the woods, had negative interactions with bear, had a female cougar hang out in our campsite during mating season. YouTube what that sounds like. It's pretty crazy. Moral of the story is we are confident and experienced with no help. The freedom of all of this all is something we really enjoy. My wife is a dental assistant raised by her mother who is a saleswoman and a father who is an aircraft mechanic. Prior to our relationship, she had little to no experience in the woods, but that changed pretty quickly once we started seeing each other. At the time of this experience, she had gained a lot of experience in the woods. I was raised by a Vietnam combat veteran turned drill instructor, turned 37-year street cop, and firearms instructor. I grew up on the range. Following high school and a couple of nowhere jobs, I ended up becoming an armored car guard, which is a job that I have and had for 11 years now. With my dad being a hardcore outdoorsman, naturally, I followed suit. This is a weird detail to include, but it will make sense later. My wife and I are avid dog people. We absolutely love our dogs. They are one of the most important things in our lives. When our last dog had a medical incident, we were the people on the floor giving doggy CPR. If something happened to my wife or I, there would be a response, but you heard our dog, John Wick, becomes a documentary. The time frame of this experience was about three summers ago, mid-June, on a quick one-night camping trip that spanned approximately 18 hours. We arrived at our campsite in mid to late afternoon. We tried to make it to a campsite that we knew and wanted to visit, but unfortunately there was still too much snow on the ground at that elevation, and as we only had one vehicle, we couldn't safely make it there. One detail that I want to include is how difficult it is to make it to this campsite. We had been exploring for quite some time after we realized we couldn't make it to our intended destination. The road leading up to this campsite is extremely steep. 
I remember making the comment to my wife that I hope that I don't have to back down, so we may not make it. Our rig is pretty built with all the aftermarket things you'd expect, skid plates, bumpers, tires, suspension, snorkels. It took some very legitimate technical driving to get there. It appeared that the campsite had not been used for some time, probably a couple of years, no garbage, very dusty on the edge of a cliff overlooking a valley. One thing that made this campsite unique was that it was in an area that had been burned out in the previous year's fire. So where you may be used to seeing the green forest of the Pacific Northwest, this had a little bit more of that ominous feel as all of the trees were basically burnt out black sticks sticking out of the ground. The weather on this day was practically beautiful. Very warm, upper 70s and no wind. One thing that stuck out to me immediately upon exiting the Xterra was just how quiet it was. The normal sounds of the woods just were not there. If you have tinnitus, you will know what I mean when I say it's one of those places where it's so quiet that you almost instantly, tinnitus will kick in. Setting up camp was pretty much business as usual. After setting up our ARB awning and the awning room, my wife quickly went sunbathing. I pretty quickly went into my normal routine of using the opportunity of being in the woods to run range drills. After a couple of hours, it did start to cool down a little bit. I went through the process of getting a fire prepped so later I wouldn't have to do it in the dark. I remember specifically that it was when I was picking up my brass from running drills that I started to just get a little cold. I'd been wearing shorts and a tank top and body armor all afternoon, so I headed into the awning room to change into some pants. I remember sitting down on my cot and thinking that I heard a dog bark. I stopped what I was doing and waited for a second, and as clear as day, I could hear a dog barking. The sound of the dog barking was extremely clear. This wasn't anywhere near the sound of some other animal in the woods. This is what you would expect to hear in your home neighborhood. This is what you would expect to hear from your neighbor's dog two houses over. Outside of the tent, I hear my wife say, Is that a dog? I had responded back by saying, Do you see anyone? She had responded back saying, no, but it sounds like it's coming from over there. As I poked my head out of the tent, she's pointing in the direction of where I had been shooting, which was essentially into an overgrown area past a berm that I had been using as a backstop. Interestingly enough, the barking stopped. I finished getting myself situated and exited the tent and walked toward the area that the barking had been coming from. I found nothing there, no evidence of any kind of animal, and furthermore, no evidence of what typically comes with a dog, a person. To be clear, the area that this barking was coming from is not an area that somebody could reach with a vehicle. There also is no alternate route they could have taken to allow somebody to drive around and approach us from the opposite side. We had taken the only road to get there and drove it until it ended. Nothing else is even close. We discussed the possibility that maybe it was a lost dog, maybe someone had driven out here and abandoned a dog, and so we essentially went into a three to five minute session of trying to call in this dog. My wife begged for us to go in, look for it. I said no. There was basically no response. It went back to being just as quiet as when we had gotten there. I don't want to say that either of us were really upset or unsettled at this point, but we were definitely feeling a little bit more heightened sense of vigilance as what was going on around us. As I said before, where there's dogs, there's people. And there really shouldn't be any people out here. We had negative experiences with people in the woods before, so naturally, any time that we may run into people in unusual circumstances, we are very careful. We continued the evening as we normally did, drinking a couple of White Claws, getting a fire started, playing the music that we used to listen to as teenagers, and cooking up some dinner. At this point, it's getting to be around 7 p.m. I had returned back to the tent to grab a hoodie because the temperature is dropping a little bit more, but it was still relatively warm for the altitude. 
Within three to five seconds of me entering the tent, the barking started again. When I heard it, I froze and listened, and it was coming from the same direction that my wife had pointed out before. Before I could even poke my head back out of the tent, my wife said out loud, Why, it only happens when you go into the tent. She's a lot smarter than me. To be completely honest, I kind of dismissed her statement intentionally and went back out and sat next to her by the fire in the evening continued. After a couple of minutes had passed, I returned to the tent again. Within a few seconds of me entering the tent, the barking started. Remember still that this is the sound of your neighbor's dog. When I exited the tent, the barking stopped, just as it had before. At this point, my wife and I shared one of those very brief moments where you lock eyes with somebody, and without saying anything, you know something's wrong. It's so difficult to describe the moment, but you just knew something was wrong. I remember turning into the tent and starting to put on all of my gear that I was using when I was running drills. We had wildlife encounters before. This was different. Something felt extremely wrong with what was happening. I put my plate carrier and my weapon and started the process of loading the magazines that I had emptied out while running drills. One thing that I remember as being practically unique was that my wife came into the tent with me and helped me start loading magazines. This is very unusual as she is somebody who is always pretty and has her nails done and absolutely hates loading magazines. So looking back on this, I think that this really speaks to how creepy the situation we had found ourselves in that she would ditch the nice spot by the fire to get into the tent and load mags. I remember when we exited the tent, both my wife and I commented on how it seemed like it had gotten extremely cold very fast and very early. I think we both exited the tent expecting to be face to face with some kind of threat that was moving in on us, but we exited the tent. There was nothing there. I looked around, some, and nothing. I even went deep into the direction of the barking and nothing, no animal tracks at all, which, frankly, puzzled me. This area was burnt out. The ground was covered in ash. It was like walking on the moon. Anything would leave tracks. We tried to return to somewhat a normal camping trip feel, if being by the fire in a full kit is normal to you. My wife sat back down by the fire. At this point, I refused to sit down, and I was more just moving around the campsite and keeping an eye on the surroundings. At this point, I'm moving around the campsite, and my visibility is starting to drop some. It's not necessarily dark, but in the woods, even being burnt out woods, it's just starting to get difficult to see more than just a few feet into the tree line. I returned to the tent to grab my helmet. With PVS-31S, leave me alone, I like my freedom. And as I walk to the tent, I make the comment to my wife that I swear to God if I hear that barking again, I go into the tent barking. Now I'm mad and scared, honestly. We started to touch on something that is so unusual in the woods that it's difficult to explain to yourself. Going back to our short planning before this camping trip, one of the reasons that we decided to take this quick camping trip was because it was just going to be a nice easy trip. There was absolutely no adverse weather anywhere on the forecast in days before, during, or after when we were taking this trip. In a time of less than 30 minutes from this, this beautiful evening with not a cloud in the sky changed into somewhat a weather nightmare. The winds picked up to the point that I actually had to use a tie-down strap that I normally never used, even in serious storms, and a heavy fog blew in, which was extremely weird for this altitude in June. I'll never forget thinking to myself that with this fog and the wind, the fog should blow through within a few minutes, but the wind continued to blow and the fog just wouldn't break. We were talking 25 feet of visibility tops. I couldn't see crap through my noodles, and they kept getting fogged out 
from all of the moisture. It almost made you dizzy because you could see the fog blowing by and no matter what direction you looked and everything was in motion and it was so cold. Suffice to say at this point, we called it. Time to go to bed. Naturally, I don't think that either of us really slept. I won't lie and tell you that we heard nothing. It was actually just dead quiet once the wind stopped about an hour after we had gone into the tent. Usually we sleep in when we go camping, but this was a little bit of a different experience. We ended up basically crawling out at first light. Once we got up, I pretty quickly surveyed the area. It looked like it was going to be another beautiful day, very sunny. So we started our normal morning camping routine. We cooked up some eggs, some bacon, and we were in the process of cooking what we had left of the bacon when my wife said, uh, people. I turned from where we were to the passenger side of the Xterra and looked through the windows and coming up the road were four people walking up the road to our campsite, two on the left and two on the right in somewhat a staggered pattern and at least one of the males was taking pictures of the campsite. If you're not somebody that goes to the woods, FYI, this is extremely unusual. Walking into somebody's campsite is like walking into their home. So naturally, when I look down the road and I see four people essentially in a small unit formation moving into my campsite, that's a problem. I walked around my vehicle to meet them, and when I said good morning, all four of them jumped like they weren't expecting people to be there. It was two males and two females, and they basically took a second to look at each other like they weren't sure who should be the one to speak up for whatever was going on. This seemed a little bit weird to me because when you're walking up on an obvious campsite, you can see a vehicle, tent, fire pit, etc., but they were surprised to see people there. A male claimed that they were bird watching and very cautiously all four of them turned around and started walking back down the road. The male who stated they were bird watching looked back up at me several more times. I couldn't help but notice that he seemed extremely situationally aware. Following this interaction, we were pretty much maxed out on what we were willing to deal with. We typically pack in an organized fashion, but this was not one of those trips. We kind of just threw everything into the car, got everything loaded up, and started to head back down the mountain. At the bottom of the aforementioned extremely steep and rugged road to the campsite, we passed a parked SUV occupied by just one driver. We did not see the additional four personnel on our drive back down. All had appeared to be physically fit and of military age. Alright, so I know a few people are going to be like, Jeff, why did you even include this? It didn't even have cryptids in it. In their best neck beard voice that still lives with their mom in their basement. But the reason why I did was because what the gentleman said. Be vigilant of your surroundings while in the woods with a loved one or by yourself. Now, the couple did experience some strange phenomenon prior to. You can't explain that dog, right? And then the weather pattern, which is very strange. Um, and then the four individuals walking up almost in a militarized pattern, uh, very strange. Now, some of you may be like, hey, you know, maybe they were looking for their lost dog. Well, wouldn't that be your first comment to or question to the people that you just stumbled into their campsite would be? Hey, sorry to bother you folks, but uh, we lost our dog last night. You wouldn't happen to see or hear him. Instead, it's we're bird watching. Now, possibly... This is just a possibility. This couple stumbled upon a underground military, military installation. And these four or five, counting the one in the car below, 
we're sent up to kind of, you know, uh, visualize the situation. Um, maybe there was some sort of uh, weather disruption uh, machine up on this mountain. Who knows? I don't know. Um, it, it, it makes a little sense to me. Maybe these people were some sort of security team and making sure that this little military military installation underground that uh, possibly could be funded by the Air Force. Maybe it was a HARP involvement. Um, you know, who knows? Uh, supposedly, the uh, HARP program uh, was supposedly stopped, I believe, in 14 or 15. Um, this would have occurred back in like 2018. So maybe it's not stopped. Maybe they stumbled upon something that they weren't. Uh, and that's what this little team was about. But the most key important thing is why I shared this was because it really shows you that you have to be vigilant. You have to be aware of what is around you while you're in the woods. When you're in nature, you can't take it for granted. You, you do have to have your neck on a swivel. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't enjoy the outdoors. But when you are enjoying the outdoors, you should always kind of, you know, just be aware of everything, you know. I almost said situationally aware, which is another kind of military, military uh, statement. And that was what the gentleman felt from the guy who kept looking back at him so i mean something's up i believe these people stumbled upon a underground facility so moving on today's second experience all right i'm 43 years old and this took place near deadwood south dakota in the black hills when i was in fifth grade I'm pretty sure it was during the summer months between my 5th and 6th grade years in school. So quick math says I was 10, maybe 11. My birthday is in July. Anyway, that matters because at that age I was old enough to be aware of my surroundings and to know the difference between imaginary and real friends. So basically, none of this was imagined on my part and everything I am going to share is to the best of my ability slash memory, true and in no way exaggerated or over-sensationalized for effect. We lived in a small town of Leeds, South Dakota, which is about two miles further up the hill from Deadwood, South Dakota, the same Deadwood that Wild Bill Hickok was killed in, and the same Deadwood that they made a TV series after, of the same name. The area, geographically speaking, is strikingly different from the rest of its surroundings that consist of Wyoming, flat and empty. To the left, and the plains and badlands, flat and empty, to the right. The Black Hills are actually really pretty and for an area that you could easily cover on a map with your thumb, they're surprisingly dense and rugged. I can't imagine living there way back in the olden days. One winter, this bit is not at all relevant to my experience. Just a cool memory from living there. I remember it had snowed over 8 feet in only 2 days. 8 feet. That's as tall as a door frame in your home. 12 to 13 foot snowdrifts. The first day of the blizzard, there was zero wind. Somewhere, my mom has a photo of at least two feet of snow that had stacked itself up on top of the antenna of our old Chevy station wagon. That was nuts. Then the wind came with purple lightning. It was a truly insane place to live. All right, back to the experience. 
My family was considered big by today's standards. I am number three of six boys, and having been raised a Jehovah Witness, we were encouraged to keep our friends and associates, too, members of the church as much as possible. So one evening, our family was having dinner with the Spears family at their home on a piece of property near Deadwood, somewhere within maybe ten miles from the town itself. Unfortunately, I can't recall the exact location of their property, but I do recall nearby. There were some old, rusty, no longer used train tracks that went through a short tunnel that I remember was a blast to have Roman candle fireworks fighting in. This takes place in the span of about five minutes total, maybe less. But that evening it was about dusk and we had already eaten dinner and the adults were in the house getting dessert ready or doing whatever. And it was myself, my older brother Jason, and two of their kids, both boys, and we were all within a few years of age. We were out messing around a couple of hundred yards away from the barn that their family was setting up on their property. That was still under construction, but almost finished. It had exterior windows. Unsure if it was actually windows had been installed or not, but it had been a big barn door and everything. I recall we were climbing around up in the rafters of the structures, and someone on the ground level commented about a horrible stench. And within a few moments, this smell caught up with me, who was still making their way down from the rafters of the barn. I can't describe the smell, so I will attempt to describe what it smelled like. Things that smell really bad, I mean really, really bad, cause the human body to involuntary gag or throw up. This isn't something you can even have time to try and stop. It's a reflex made of everything horrible in nature. The smell hits you and is interpreted by your brain and before you can exhale, your body is trying to turn itself inside out. And that's what mine did. I clearly remember I was getting ready to hop down onto the ladder and I smelled it and instantly vomited freshly eaten spaghetti all the way down my front of my shirt and shorts. It easily could have been a pie-eating contest scene from the movie Stand By Me. Right about then we heard something outside that I had never heard before and haven't heard since. It was a big sound. You know the sound of an elephant or a howler monkey or the lions make at the zoo. This was no different. It shook the earth. You could hear it, but you could also feel it inside your body. It was something It was something alive, and it was big. Right about then, I was motionless, as we were all staring at each other wide-eyed, and while I was standing up in the rafters, the entire friggin' structure creaked and groaned as the exterior wall was pushed on from my left to the right. It was violent enough that I had to quickly kneel down and grasp the wooden beam I was standing on to keep from falling down to the ground. I probably moved six to eight inches literally sideways. That's a lot of movement for a single story structure attached to a foundation to move. The dog was going ape crazy. Its fur was standing straight up on its back and it was in a defensive posture holding its ground looking directly at the place on the broad side of the barn that the sound had come from and the movement originated from with the big barn door behind it. I hopped down onto the ground and had one of those moments of clarity. Thoughts. Is this about to come through the wall? As my brother and the two boys we were with started scrambling to find something, anything to defend ourselves with. I think I ended up holding a rusty pair of garden shears or something. I recall the dog, a nice-sized German shepherd, turned toward the door and ran out and rounded the corner in a very offensive attack posture, and it was obvious it was going out to protect its humans or die trying. I'm in my mind 40, and I had never witnessed that kind of split-second bravery, even in a human. One of the boys ran after the dog, clearly concerned that the dog 
was now in danger, and we all ran out of the barn with our makeshift torches and pickforts, minus the torches, in an attempt to do something, anything to investigate the dog having put itself in harm's way. Right behind the barn there were bushes, and this hill started up pretty steep, like 45 degree angle. It was steep enough to climb up, but steep enough that it would have been a pain in the ass. It was literally overgrown with brush, trees, and all that other stuff. We rounded the corner of the barn, and all we see is this very dark figure that resembles a 10-foot-tall football player. And if its uniform and helmet was a dark-colored ghillie suit. It turned and ran full speed on two legs. I clearly recall it was grasping and spatting while breaking through the trees and bushes on its way up this steep hillside. It was like a cartoon. Dark figure runs up the hill as bushes and trees rustle and break. Then it zigs and runs further as the trees and bushes rustle. Then zags and runs further as trees crash and break and bushes rustle violently. Whoosh, whoosh, crash, slam, whoosh, snap, bam, crash, bang, crash. It was up and over this incline in maybe 10 seconds. This was a mountain. And it ran up faster than I've ever seen anything run ever. It sprinted up an incline steeper than the laws of physics would allow you to drive a vehicle and completely overgrown with thick brush and trees. The entire encounter, this thing was screaming louder than I could if I were to curl my lips and below as loud as I could right now. Hell. It was louder than three to four adults could yell, if all yelling at the same time, and yelling as if they were trying to permanently mess up their voices. But it wasn't human, but it was screaming. The dog ran back to us after having given up chasing a quarter of the way up the hill, and there we were, all four of us kids with a dog, none of us dead. And... With the fires of hell lit under our feet, we flew back to the house and exploded on the front door, all of us babbling, panting, and crying, and puke-covered and freaking out. But it was mostly dark by this point, and the adults dismissed us and our story, saying we must have seen an elk, a deer, or a bear. No, I've seen all of those in the wild lots of times. And... When was the last time a bear screamed at you and ran up two feet? A possible, an impossible incline, grasping at everything. Bears don't grasp, and they don't scream. Well, there you have it, folks. Tonight's second half. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going, and honestly what gives folks like us a place and a chance to share our experiences and theories judgment-free, just simply treat it with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant. Keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, and friends, these creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with the people you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless.